Crisis is what we're talking about today. Crisis. Moms are important, I think, because they stave off crisis. I experienced this when my wife left me home alone for the first time with our daughter, who was four months old. It was Christmas, and I was doing a great job. I'm just going to go ahead and pat myself on the back. I was doing it superbly. This goes badly later. And so Hattie, it was Hattie, and she was crying for, she wanted something to eat. And so I set her on the little like pillow thing that they have that's supposed to be super secure. And I set her on the couch and I went to the kitchen to go get the bottle. And while I'm there, I hear, and then I hear lots of crying. And so I take off running and it's, I mean, the couch is like over the bar so I can see what's happening. And so I see that she's fallen down somehow. Great time to pick your first time to roll over, Hads. Thank you. And so I like take off running and I've got to turn the corner and I take it at speed and I forget that I'm wearing socks. And so my legs kick out from under me. I slide into the Christmas tree. We're both on the ground writhing in pain and I'm like trying to army crawl over to her and be like, I'm coming. I will help you. Crisis. Crisis. And as funny as that is, and as we've both, I think, recovered, Uh, from that, uh, not very many crises are funny. It's not funny. There are things you're probably going through right now that aren't funny. Maybe they're big things, and it's something that's been going on for a while. Maybe you, you just lost a job, or you're in conflict with somebody, or maybe they're small things. Maybe you just don't like the way you look today. You just feel, meh, I don't feel good today. Or maybe because it's Mother's Day, you're just not a good day. You hear people say, happy Mother's Day, and you're like, not likely. You know, there's some people that really like it, some people who, they have a good relationship with their mom, or they've got kids of their own, and they're they're super excited, they got grandkids, God has blessed them that way, and, and they're just super pumped. But for you, maybe today's not that kind of a day. Maybe you want kids, you don't have them. Maybe it's because you're not married yet. Maybe uh, you're a single mom. And so while you appreciate it, it's just really difficult. You're reminded of how much actually rests on your shoulders. Maybe you don't have a good relationship with your mom. And, or maybe just right now you don't have a good relationship with your mom. Maybe you guys did, something broke. Maybe one of you is just going through a season where it's hard. Or maybe your mom's no longer with us. Maybe your mom's passed on. And so today can be a hard day. It can be a day of crisis, or if not today's the day of crisis, it can be a day that highlights that crisis. And so we're going to talk today about how crises are actually places where our faith can be strengthened and, and our faith can actually shape the crises we go through. So as we read, we're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 2, and we're going to see three things that God can use crisis for in our lives. And the first is that crisis reorients our affections It reorients our affections. The book of Samuel opens with a story about a man named Elkanah. And Elkanah is married to two women. One is named Hannah, and she's not capable of having children. And it says specifically that this is because God has closed her womb. God has very intentionally not allowed her to have children. On the other hand, he's married to another woman named Penina, and she is having lots of kids. And this is obviously very difficult for Hannah Hannah struggling to figure out what her place is because a woman who cannot have children or struggles to have children or who's dealing with miscarriages or things like that, it's incredibly difficult. That is a crisis in any era. It has all kinds of effects on you as a person. But especially in the ancient world, much of your worth and value as a woman was found in the children that you produced, especially sons. And so every year, this is during the time of the judges, there's no king. And so the time of the judges was just a brutal time, just a nasty time to be alive. It says in the book of Judges, everybody did what was right in their own eyes and there was no king in Israel. It's the wild, wild west. And so there's this one man named Elkanah and every year he takes his family down to Shiloh where the temple or the the house of God is and they worship, they do their yearly sacrifices. So he's a righteous man. And while they're there one time, Hannah finally just has enough. 
And she goes to see God and she prays and she asks for a son. And she says, if you give me a son, God, I will give him back to you. And what this means is she's gonna dedicate him to the temple. And so lo and behold, it says that God blessed her. She had a son named Samuel. She raises him for about three years and then she gives him to the temple and she sees him about once a year, brings him a new set of clothes and everything. And out of this comes this song in chapter two. And one of the things we need to get right about Hannah and it's something that Jeff said in his prayer is that Hannah doesn't try to finagle things. She doesn't try to, to live like the culture around her. She doesn't say, my God's not working for me. I'm gonna go get another God that will help me be fertile. No. Hannah is probably the most righteous woman in the Old Testament. She's the only woman in scripture, or sorry, in the Old Testament, who makes a vow and fulfills it to God. She has the longest prayer in the Old Testament. She doesn't try to force God's hand either. Sarah and Rachel both do things with their infertility to try and finagle it to be like, oh, look, God, I, I, you, God blessed us. And God's like, that's not really what I had in mind. Hannah doesn't do that. She just goes to the Lord. When she offers her child, she doesn't offer him as a child sacrifice, which was uh, uh, common in that day. And there's a guy in Judges, his name's Jephthah. He wants a great military victory. And he says, God, I'll sacrifice to you the first thing that comes out of my house. Well, guess what goes out to meet him after the battle? His daughter. And the Bible's vague about what happens. But I'm thinking just based on the character of Judges that he actually winds up killing his daughter, which is not something God wants. But she doesn't do this either. And her song, her song is amazing. You know why her song is amazing? It's because in the midst of all this crisis, in the midst of all this difficulty, in the midst of all this challenge, her, her affections get reoriented to God. Look again at the first three verses of this, of this chapter, in chapter two. And Hannah prayed and said, my heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is none holy like the Lord for there is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. Talk more, no, no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth for the Lord is a God of knowledge and by him actions are weighed. You know what's amazing about her song? is it is completely focused on God. In fact, if I had not just told you what Hannah's story was about, and if you didn't know what Hannah's story was about, you'd be like, what is she singing this song for? You don't know. It's not specifically about uh, infertility. It's not about rivalry with this woman named Panina. Think about all the things that Hannah goes through. Think about being a young bride, being optimistic, and, and you get married to this man that you love. And you want to provide children for him. And all of a sudden, it starts being difficult. And then because in that culture, having sons was really important for inheritance, he decides he's going to marry another woman to provide children. He still loves her. He still provides for her. In fact, he treats her very well. But think about the sadness and the bitterness and the frustration that can creep in. But what's amazing about Hannah is that she changes and the reason why she sings the song that she sings is because over the years of struggle, it changes her. It doesn't make her bitter, it makes her better. You see, Hannah has been in crisis for years. The, the ridiculous thing about my story is that that was a momentary crisis. No ill effects were felt. We moved on. I don't even think I told Kim about it. And she missed the last service, so she's not going to hear about it. Unless y'all... Pastor confidentiality, it goes two ways, okay? <laughs> but Hannah has been in crisis for years. It starts when she begins to wonder if there's something wrong, if she can't have kids, and then her husband marries somebody else. And then every single day, and it says that Panina has multiple children. So this is going on for years, maybe five, maybe 10 years. So every day she wakes up, she sees this brood of children that her rival has. And every single day, she has to go with the other women to get water and to do other things that were the responsibilities of the woman in that day and age. And she has to see all these children with them everywhere. And then she's got to go down to the temple. She's got to go to church every time. And she's got to see all these children and all these women that are fulfilled. And she has to wonder, what's wrong with me? Why don't I have this? She's in crisis for years. And then when she gets 
the thing that she desires, when God fulfills her request, you know what happens? She has to live for three more years knowing this child that she's becoming more and more attached to. She's got to give him back to God. And I don't know about you, but I would be so tempted over the course of three years to find ways to get out of that vow. And in fact, in the Old Testament, a husband could override the vows of his wife. Imagine how tempting that must have been for her. Maybe I can manipulate Elkanah into overriding my vow. Maybe I can get him to, to, to over, override it so I don't have to do this. But she sticks by it. She hangs with it. Her song is a response to the years that she has waited for God to work and the years she has waited to fulfill her vow. And that's what crisis does. Crisis forges new affections for the people that you go through crises with. That's what it does. That's what happens in the military. Military is a weird place. There's people you get along with and there's people you very much don't get along with. There are people you're like, golly, I can't stand you. But then you go through stuff together. You go through training together. You, you go through combat together. And all of a sudden, you realize that that person that you guys don't really see eye to eye, that person has got your back. And this is what can happen to us in our relationship with God. God can, can begin to draw close to us. We can sense his presence in ways we don't understand, in ways that you wouldn't fully understand had you not been through the crisis that you went through. We talked about this a few weeks ago, but this is what happened to me uh, in my struggle with anxiety. I understand God in a way that I never would if I didn't have this daily struggle going on in my life. In fact, to the point where I don't know that I would trade it to not have this relationship that I have now with him. But we can't waste a good crisis. And every time we try to handle it on our own, every time we try to struggle through it on, every time we act like, oh, it's not that big of a deal, I'm gonna be okay. We waste it. We waste it. And what's interesting is in, in Hannah's story, it says that God closed her wombs. God, womb, God did this to her. And it's so easy to be like, God, why are you doing this to me? Why have you singled me out? And we want to understand, Job wants to understand. Job says in 13, 15 of the book of Job, he says, though he slay me, yet I will still worship him. But Job still wants to understand. What I think is interesting about the dedications that we just did right here, I was watching the babies who have no idea what's happening. No clue. But that does not make it any less significant and it does not make it any less valuable for their spiritual walk with God. You do not have to understand something for it to be significant and meaningful and for God to be working. We live in an age of empiricism. We worship understanding. We've long since set aside the fact that our, our faith is mystery. We need to get more comfortable with that idea. Hannah is, and that's why she can worship. She's like, I don't understand why I wasn't able to have kids, and I don't understand why I'm able to have kids now, but I know God's doing it, and I will worship. This is what it can do for us. This is what, what a crisis can do for us in our lives. We can draw close to the Lord, but we can also recognize that our crisis isn't just our crisis. There's other people, there's other things, there's other ways that our crisis is bigger than just the small little thing we feel. Hannah recognizes this. She knows there are women who have come before her who've struggled with the same thing she has, Sarah, Rachel, and a host of others. You are not the only one to go through what you're going through. And that's why the church is a place where you can be with other people who can help walk you through what you're going through. We want to be here with you in that. The church is here for you. We need to recognize that our crises are not just our crises. They're everybody's crisis. We share in those burdens together. So how do we do this? How do we get our eyes off of our own thing and elevate and look up and, and recognize that? Well, it leads us to the next part of the song. It's crisis reverses our afflictions. It reverses our afflictions. Look at verse four. The bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble bind on strength. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry have ceased to hunger. 
The barren has borne seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. These are three different reversals that take place in the midst of crisis. The crisis in each one is a military crisis, a, a hunger, a famine, and then childlessness. All are major crises in any era, but again, especially in the ancient world. And notice the reversals that are taking place. It's a reversal each time. It's not the mighty who are winning. It's the weak. It's not the hungry who are, or it's not the full who are satisfied. It's the hungry. It's not the childless who are, are, are satisfied. It's, it's the ones, or sorry, it's not the ones who have children. It's the childless. See, even I struggle with the reversals. This is what God is doing. And what Hannah is doing here is she's telling you that this is how the Bible is supposed to work. She's telling you that this is how God works. And she's telling you, because we're in the very beginning of First and Second Samuel, which were originally one book, by the way, she's telling you that this is how the story's going to go from here on out. You have Eli and Hophni and Phinehas, who were a family that were running the temple establishment, or the house of God, rather. We won't have the temple yet. And Eli's pretty much passive. The best thing you can say about him is he's negligent. But his sons are awful. The women who come to pray at the temple, they take advantage of them. They take the best pieces of the sacrifice. And they're overthrown. They're eventually overturned. All three of them are killed in one day. And Samuel takes their place. Her son. And Samuel anoints a king named Saul. And Saul is proud. He's arrogant. He does some things right. But mostly he just gets worse and worse and worse. And he's eventually supplanted by David. A little shepherd boy. And that shepherd boy killed a giant. And you see all the reversals that are taking place. People being raised up, people being brought down. And this is what God does. These reversals that take place again and again and again. We live in a world that's in crisis. I'm not talking about the violence that we see. I'm not even talking about climate change. We live in a world that's in crisis because of the first crisis that ever took place. And it's the exact same thing. We, we do the exact same thing our first parents did. Adam and Eve, they ate from the fruit of the tree and they were faced with a crisis. The serpent was there saying, God really isn't as good as you think he is. And it's a crisis of faith. And they say, well, I guess we'll have to handle things on our own from here on out. And so they take from the tree and they eat it because they gotta be equipped to handle it. And then we do this all the time. We're hit with a crisis. We're faced with the idea that maybe God's not as good as we thought he is. Maybe Maybe the, the faith we had when we were little, when we got dedicated or whatever, isn't really big enough to handle the real world. And so we, we, we fall on our own means. We, we try to figure out our own ways to handle it. And all of this leads to a greater affliction, a greater challenge, a greater struggle. Many of us are in crisis today. It's hard to get up and come to church today, maybe. Maybe. Maybe it's just because you're tired. Not that you're angry with the Lord. You're just exhausted. It's been a rough week. I get that. Maybe you are frustrated with the Lord. Maybe you're struggling to see the goodness of God. Maybe you're a, a, a teenager, a preteen, and you're entering that phase of life where mom and dad don't really seem to understand what's going on. And let's be honest. You're growing up in a world that is, frankly, unprecedented. In many cases, we may not understand. And you can use that. You can say, Mom, the man in the blazer said you guys don't understand. <laughs> I didn't listen to anything else he said, but I listened to that. <laughs> and maybe it does feel like that, that Mom and Dad don't understand. Or maybe you're, you've got these, these, a whole bunch of feelings going on, and like you want to love and honor your mom. You want to respect your mom and dad. But at the same time, you're just so frustrated. I get that. It can seem like a crisis, an ongoing crisis, one that happens again and again and again. But there's good news in the midst of this, in the midst of crisis. And it's this. Every single bit of strength, every single bit of comfort, every single thing that comes your way that helps you go one more day and one more day. You know what those are? Those are promises from God. Those are down payments from the Lord reminding you that one day the greater affliction, the first crisis that caused all other crises, that's going to be overturned. That's going to be overthrown. We're not going to have crises anymore. We're not going to have those problems because one day our Savior will return and raise us from the dead and the crises will be no more. Game over. 
And so every time you're like, man, I don't know if I can get out of bed today, and you swing your feet out, and you put them on the ground, and you stand up, you know what that is? That's a trumpet call. That's a blast into the world saying, nope, It's going to end one day. I am trusting and I have faith that God is going to do something great. It's a statement of faith. What do you think the miracles of Jesus were all about? One, they were about him notifying everybody that I'm the Messiah. I'm the one that's come to change all this. But think about all the people that were healed. The blind, the deaf, those who can't walk. Do you know what happened to them as they aged? The same thing that happens to us as we age. You go from being able to see to needing readers. Maybe you have cataracts. You go from being able to hear, hear a pin drop to not be able to hear when somebody yells at you, which may not be that bad. You go from being able to run marathons to not being able to get out of bed without nine different bones popping in your body. We call that 40. (laughs) Some of us, it was 30. And what do you think happened to Lazarus in John chapter 11 when he was raised from the dead? You know what, how his story ends? He dies again. Because all those miracles are promises that one day the great miracle of eternal life will actually happen. And the vision and the hearing and the walking and the running and the life, it all comes back. And it comes back not just as it once was, but better than it's ever been. You see, our crisis are reminders that God is going to overturn the great crises. And so how we respond to this is that we go and we start to alleviate other people's crises. We recognize, that's why I was talking about getting your head out of your own crisis. You've got to start looking around to other people's crises and alleviating those And you might be like, well, Travis, I don't know how to find those people out. I don't know what's going on. Of course you do. We're like bloodhounds for a good crisis. That's why reality TV is so popular. We're like, ooh. Y'all, it's called gossip. This is why gossip is so heinous. It's not because you're talking about people behind their backs. or Who cares? They probably care, but I'm just saying hypothetically, who cares? But it's so heinous because we take somebody's dark moments, their deep struggles, the pain that's going on in their life, and we're like, I've got something to talk about at dinner tonight. It becomes fodder for our conversations. You get to be the person with the juiciest thing to tell rather than being the person who alleviates that struggle, rather than the person who hits your knees when you think about it, and you're like, I don't know how they're getting out of bed in the morning. I couldn't do it. There's so many ways to go about alleviating the crisis in people's lives. We've got a bunch of opportunities on our website, on the serve page. You can check that out. You can also come to South Texas. Kim and I are going in October. You're welcome to come with us. October 11th to the 14th. Shameless plug. Come on. Maybe it's just putting your arm around somebody and just being like, hey, I love you, and God's going to do something in this. And I don't have any answers. I think the alleviation of crisis is probably way easier than we think it is. Way easier. And you know why it's way easier? It's because crisis reveals our rescuer. It reveals our rescuer. Verse 6, the Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and on them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness. For not by might shall a man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king. That's important. Strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. There's a problem with Hannah's song. It's not right. What is she talking about? A king. There's no king in Israel. It's the time of judges. There's no king. Saul's not going to be anointed for at least another 40 years, 50 years. So what's she talking about? This is a prophecy. She's looking forward to the day of a king. Because all these things that God is supposed to do in the, in the, in the song, 
the exalting and the bringing low and the smashing of the enemies, God is supposed to do that through his king, through his anointed one. And that anointed word means Messiah, through his Christ. And so what Hannah's telling you is, you're going to meet two kings in this, in this book. You're going to meet Saul and you're going to meet David. And the way you judge whether or not they're a good king is whether or not they do these things. Because then you'll know that God is working through them or you'll know that God is not working through them. This is the scorecard for whether or not you have a good king or not. And some of them do really well. David and Saul, well, it says here in verse 6 that the Lord kills. They do a lot of killing. They do a lot of bringing up. They do a lot of laying low. David at one point takes somebody who's the son of his best friend, Jonathan, who's totally cast out, and he takes him and he brings him to eat with him permanently. He has a seat at his table, and he talks about this, the poor from the ash heap to sit with princes. So they do some things really well, but they also do some things really poorly. One of the things they can't do is the very first thing. They can't bring to life. They can't raise anybody up from the dead. They don't elevate all of the poor either. It says they elevate the poor. Some of the people they actually make poorer. Where do you think all those soldiers come from in all their battles? They come from the sons of the people that they're supposed to be ruling and protecting. Where do you think all of David's many wives come from? The people taking this, their daughters for his own pleasure and purpose. Sometimes they get the righteous and the wicked backwards. David kills Uriah but protects his wicked son Absalom. So yeah, David is supposed to be the fulfillment of this, but he is not a very good one. That means there has to be somebody else. There has to be a greater David. There has to be a greater Saul. There has to be somebody else to deliver us from this crisis. And this is where you get Jesus. This is why Jesus is here. No earthly king can do this. You know why I know no earthly king can do this? We go back to verse six. He's the only one who can bring back from the dead. He's the only one who can raise people to life. He's the only one who's truly the Messiah, the promised one. And Hannah knows this. Hannah knows that God is the only one who can fulfill this. Because in chapter one, verse eight, Elkanah says maybe the dumbest thing that is uttered by a man in the history of men to his wife. Are y'all ready? I don't think you're ready. The Bible would tell you to gird yourself. So gird yourself. Hannah is aggrieved that she doesn't have children. And Elkanah goes to her and actually says this. Why are you so sad? Am I not worth more to you than 10 sons? Whoo! Elkanah seems like a good dude. He's dumb, but he's good. And she doesn't answer him. You know why she doesn't answer him? Shouldn't have to. It says in the next verse that she gets up and she goes and sees God. Because Elkanah, even in his foolishness, points her to the truth of the matter is that nothing in the world would be better than 10 sons. And she realizes, she realizes the idol in her life. And she goes to the Lord and says, Lord, you're the only one who can fulfill me. You're the only one who can satisfy me. You're the only one that is better than 10 sons. Help me. And it says that Hannah rose. It's like this intentional decision that she makes. And today, we have an opportunity to give honor and glory, to rise and go to our Lord. It says in this passage again, remember, that this king, this Messiah, is going to take those who are on the ash heap, those who have no value or worth, and elevate them to eat with princes. What do you think Jesus does on that cross? When we put our faith and trust in him, he elevates us off the ash heap of sin and death and evil and the brokenness that we have, the unworthiness we have from before God, and he invites us to eat with him at his table. You know how the Bible ends? For those of us who love food, it's the best ending possible. It's a big feast. It's a big celebration. And guess who's invited? Everybody who has put their faith and trust in Jesus' death, his burial, and resurrection. For those of us who recognize that not only our greatest crisis, but every crisis we face, we are incapable of handling. And Jesus has to be the one to handle it. And so I don't know what you're going through today. I don't know if all of a sudden the Holy Spirit is working in your life and he's speaking to you and he's saying, you need the Messiah. You need the, the Messiah to elevate you off the ash heap. 
Or maybe you're just in the midst of a crisis and you're like, I'm struggling. Might be something short, might be something long-term, but we have an opportunity today to rise before the Lord. And so what I want us to do is I want us to close our eyes. You everybody just close your eyes. I'm gonna close them too once I finish talking. I'm gonna close your eyes. And you have the opportunity to do what Hannah did, to rise. And so what we're gonna do is when Hannah rises, she goes to the, the house of God and she prays and Eli's there and Eli blesses her. And so what I'd like to do is I'm just gonna invite you and I'm, I've got my eyes closed too. If you're in the midst of a crisis and you want God, maybe you need a relationship with the Lord, whatever it is, I'm going to give you the opportunity just to stand up right where you are. Nobody's looking. Just stand up. And if if you can't stand today, raise your hand. You're in the midst of a crisis. You can stand up. Nobody's looking. And by standing up, you're just doing what Hannah did. You're saying, I am not going to be satisfied by any solution that I come up with. I need the Lord and his help. And I'm going to pray over you. And that's how we're going to end today. And the band's going to come back up here and we're going to sing together. And so, Father God, I pray. I thank you that you have used crisis in our lives, the different crises that we face. I thank you that you have blessed us with something that's hard. And it may not seem like a blessing right now, but Lord, you're going to, you're going to work and you're going, to, you're going to move in such a way that, that shows us who you are, that reorients our affections to you and and that reverses our afflictions and that reveals who you are. And so God, I pray for these standing, for those maybe raising their hands, Lord God, I pray for each of us. Even if you haven't acknowledged that you're in a crisis, God, I pray for each of us. I pray that deliverance would come. I pray that that faith would be strengthened. And I pray that your name would be made great. And I pray that out of our own lips, we would be able to sing how we have been lifted up, how we have been raised off the ash heap to fellowship with God. You can go ahead and be seated. Put your hand down. And Lord, we ask all this in your son's name. Amen.